From a dispatch employee who gets aggressive with a customer over a call. I'm adding an extra stop. There's, there's no question within my mind. But it's on the way home. You're lying to me. To a workshop employee who cuts corners on fixing. My goal is is to get this car in and out of my area as quick as possible. The quality, the quality is good. Is it done the way somebody would learn in school? No. This video is going to cover some of the rudest and most idiotic employees to have ever been on Undercover Boss. Just wait and watch these employees get themselves fired. It is going to be one hell of a ride. So kicking it off, we have the owner of a luxury chauffeur transportation service that has locations in over 700 cities worldwide going undercover. I don't think there is a place you can go that we can't pick you up. The episode mentioned above is the sixth episode of the sixth season. Chairman and CEO of Empire CLS was this episode's boss and he was going undercover to figure out whether his company was running smoothly. In a suit and tie, or they see me on my motorcycle, so they're gonna see me sort of preppy. I don't know how they'll spot me looking like that. For his first job, Sealinger heads out to Las Vegas at the Executive to get in more touch with what was going on in the most important part of the business, chauffeuring. Today I'm going to be working with one of the chauffeurs at Executive Las Vegas, which is our affiliate in Las Vegas, Nevada. Sealinger hasn't chauffeured in ages, but feels confident that he will be able to manage just fine. Now, I haven't driven as a chauffeur probably in 25 years, but it's like riding a bicycle. You never lose it. I'm a chauffeur for Executive. Okay. This is a true test for Sealinger as a CEO. While on the job, Sealinger learns that not chauffeuring all this time had caused him to lose touch. He was being corrected on minor details that he would miss by the chauffeur who was accompanying him that day. CEO or not, there's always a lot to learn. After that job, Sealinger heads out to Secaucus, New Jersey to work at the Empire CLS headquarters. He was quite excited about this job since he felt this was an area of his business that he didn't have much hands-on experience with. My greatest fear being at this facility is that I will get caught. I'm seen here a lot, but hopefully with this great disguise, I won't be seen. Uh-oh. Looks like the employees are going to have to watch out for this since Sealinger is going to be extra aware of everything that was going on there. Sealinger is working at the dispatch center, which deals with logistics and most importantly handles the customers. This was the backbone of the company. Sealinger is paired with Anthony, a dispatcher to learn the ropes of the job. As the two start to work, Sealinger is impressed by Anthony's work and even praises him for it. The perfect dispatcher is somebody that can juggle a lot of things at one time from speaking with customers, immediately speaking then to a chauffeur, to training. I think you're ready for some live calls, man. Anthony gives a demo to Sealinger before letting him handle a customer call. This is when a customer calls in requesting a detour. The customer explains his situation, and Anthony asks the customer to put the chauffeur on the line. Are you on location? No. Are you going to be late? No, I'm not. Well, thank you very much. This is when Anthony has a sudden shift in his attitude. He tells the chauffeur to take him off speaker since he only wants to speak to the chauffeur himself. No problem, sir. No problem at all. Can I speak to the and chauffeur? And if I'm there for more than three minutes, you can charge me. I'm going to have to take this one, bro. Can I just speak with the chauffeur for one second, please? I just want to run something by the chauffeur. Sure. Sealinger looks quite shocked at this rude attitude of Anthony's. Is this on the way to his house? You don't have me on speakerphone, do you? I want to talk to you, not him. Since the customer is asking for a detour, it definitely does cause a delay in the travel. But the customer requests this since he was a long-standing customer of the company. Despite this, Anthony takes it upon himself and even calls the customer a liar. This guy was just asking to be fired. He's familiar with the city as well, bro. I'm adding an extra stop. There's, there's no question within my mind. But it's on the way home! You're lying to me. Literally 10 feet, and then that's it, and I get right back on the highway. <laughs> Luckily for him, Sealinger actually hears his story out, which ultimately lets him keep his job. This guy just cut it too close. Next up, this employee has a different approach when it comes to training newcomers. The boss is shocked to see that such an employee is working at his establishment. So, um, like this right here, because nobody is like in here, I would sweep that up. The toppings area is where it gets to be swept. Cray. Yeah. This was the fifth episode of the fifth season of Undercover Boss, and the company for this episode was Menchie's, a self-serve frozen yogurt chain based out of Encino, California. Menchie's is the largest self-serve frozen yogurt chain in the world. Menchie's has locations in over 35 states in the U.S. and in over eight countries. This dessert dynasty sells more than 30 million cups of yogurt a year. The man leading this company was Amit Kleinberger. Kleinberger goes undercover as Alan Stein, an aspiring entrepreneur on a TV show looking for experience to start his own business. The camera crew were all set up under this ruse, and a fake host was even hired for this task. Quite the commitment to make sure things are low-key. 
they have no idea this is actually undercover boss. After his first job in Seattle, Washington, Kleinberger heads out to Bonnie Lake in Washington to shadow yet another shift leader. Hi! I'm looking for Drew. Yep, that's me. Hi, I'm Alan. Hi! Kleinberger is assigned to Drew, a shift leader working at the location. As Drew starts to explain the do's and don'ts of the job, Kleinberger is upset with the lack of enthusiasm that she explains with. She tells Kleinberger in the most boring tone about how things were going to work, and this has left Kleinberger in an annoyed state. Someone walks in the door, greet him right away, you know, hi, welcome to Menchie's, how you doing today, whatever. Drew sure is pushing the boss's buttons without even realizing it. Since a customer walks in, Drew takes this chance to give a demo of what was supposed to be done and how. After this, Drew turns around to Kleinberger and tells him the importance of having to always keep a smile while on the job. But this is when Drew says something that will shock you. So just always smiley, happy. I mean, if you want to be rude, I guess that could be a twist, but I mean, I wouldn't recommend it. Okay. Um, that was Drew's attempt at cracking a joke, but Kleinberger doesn't seem to be too impressed by her. Behind the cameras, Drew says that talking to Kleinberger is like talking to a wall. Talking to Alan is like talking to the yogurt machine. No way to be talking about the CEO, especially not behind his back and on camera. Drew then explains some more parts of the job and then tells Kleinberger to start sweeping the place while singing songs about how she doesn't want to work. I would sweep that up. Okay. You can do it. Okay. I don't want to have to work. <laughs> Mind you that she's saying all this out loud while the customers are present. Kleinberger puts his complete effort into the jobs he's given, but Drew doesn't glance over or even give him any instructions on how to do the job properly. All she had done was given a briefing and then asked a newbie to clean up. Cleaning tables, machines from the front, the drip trays, and Drew is not really walking me through the steps and explaining. This was no way for an existing employee to talk to a new one. The two of them go about the different parts of the job, and Kleinberger comes to the realization that he wasn't learning anything on the job. Drew constantly kept dropping hints at what she wanted him to do while she stood around bossing him. This is not how I envision training of a new team member in our organization. Jeeves, get the slicer. Okay. I don't have to do anything. So, take this. Uh-huh. Cut off each end. Okay. And peel away. Okay. Kleinberger is pissed off, and he is disappointed that this was the way that his employees were being trained. After Kleinberger and Drew go drop off some of the garbage, the two return to the store to continue their shifts. During this, Drew says this to Kleinberger, and you will not believe it. Working here at Menchie's um, pretty much sucks. That's not my favorite. Drew tells Kleinberger that pretty people shouldn't be allowed to do anything, and all Kleinberger can do is laugh at this statement. No employee has ever looked right in the eye of the boss and uttered these words. Drew sure is an example of a terrible employee. Following that mess of an employee, we have another one who managed to get on the wrong side of the boss when he tells the boss of something shocking. In the fourth episode of the sixth season, the president of Mako, an automotive care franchise, goes undercover to see if his company was functioning like a well-oiled engine. Jose Costa, the president of the company, was controlling over 480 shops throughout the U.S. and more in Canada. Costa had made his way into the business after coming to the U.S. as an immigrant. Despite being the president of an automotive shop franchise, Costa didn't have much experience with cars. Actually, you might be surprised I'm not a car guy. I've never painted a car. I've never sanded a car. Looks like his time undercover is going to be tough. Despite this, Costa was given the position because of his talents, and this says a lot about him as a person. While going undercover, Costa's concerns are on how well the employees and franchises were following the company guidelines. I'm very concerned that our franchisees are not following our guidelines. Like most of the episodes, Costa was going undercover as an Argentinian entrepreneur on a TV show, trying to win his own business. Costa makes sure his disguise is believable, and then he's all set for his undercover job. Costa makes his way to his first job in Orlando, Florida, where he would be working as a body technician. Costa had particularly chosen this franchise since they had the best reviews for body detailing and ranked number nine on the overall list. They do $2.5 million, and I want to learn from the best. Costa is paired with Jim, a body technician working at the franchise. Costa makes it very clear to the camera that he was indeed nervous about the job since he had no prior experience in such a field. I'm really nervous. I'm going to screw up. The two meet and Jim doesn't waste any time and instructs Costa to first go and change into the uniform. 
Jim then brings Costa over to the first car that he would work on and explains to him what all needed to be done for the job. Each dent and scratch that were on the car had to be cleared off within a specific amount of time. Otherwise, a body tech could be stuck on the same work for several hours. And since the employees were getting paid for the work they do and not the amount of time they work, time was money. Jim makes it clear that Costa gets what he's talking about and tells this to him. Time is money, time is money. If, if you want to make more, you have to work more. After this, the two of them get to work and Costa seems to be doing okay in his job. Meanwhile, Jim watches over Costa to make sure that the work is done right and on time. Costa is given a car all to himself to work on, and Jim comes and goes as he checks on the work being done. While sanding the car that he is given, Costa messes up and Jim says that his three-year-old child could do better. Jim struggles to put it as nicely as possible when it comes to telling Costa that he sucked. This is when Jim comes back around to the point of managing time and then curiously says this. Using the minimal amount. My goal is, is to get this car in and out of my area as quick as possible. The quality, the quality is good. Is it done the way somebody would learn in school? No. Costa is disappointed when he hears this and even questions Jim. Jim replies telling him that cutting corners sometimes is all right as long as the work is completed on time. Looks like Jim's got his time management down, but his ethics are still lacking a lot to be desired. Last but not least, this next employee takes it a bit too far when it comes to games. The boss is so infuriated that he immediately phones it in. The way he approached and interacted with the girls is just really not acceptable behavior. I, I think it is a serious matter. I think it needs some, you know, some immediate action. In the second episode of the first season, the CEO of Hooters, Kobe Brooks, goes undercover to see if his company was operating with the same high standards. Headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, Hooters was one of the largest growing restaurants in the U.S. The company was started by Brooks' father in 1983, and the company had over 400 locations at the time of the episode. Since Hooters focused on employing women waiters, this had caused the name of Hooters to only be associated with women in short shorts. This meant that the company was falling behind in sales, and this is what Brooks wanted to find a solution for by going undercover. For his first job, Brooks heads out to Dallas, Texas, where he would be working in the kitchen helping out in the service. Little does Brooks realize that the day he would work was going to be super hectic. Brooks had a hard time managing to do all the duties that are given to him and struggles to keep calm while working, even breaking some dishes in the process. Brooks learns that the job required an employee to be on call at any point, especially during rush hours. After that, Brooks heads out to South Arlington, Texas to another one of his franchises. Brooks was there to observe the general manager who was supposed to coach and take care of the employees. The manager at this branch is Jimbo and his methods were going to be put to the test. Jimbo hands over the uniform to Brooks and then sits down with him to explain what the job was going to be. Jimbo and Brooks' first job together is inspecting the waitress's dress code. Oh, the first thing we're going to do is uniform lineup. Okay. All right, bam, we're going to line these girls up. After explaining the job, Jimbo brings over Brooks to introduce to the girls. But Jimbo gives a nickname for Brooks, which Brooks isn't too happy about. And ladies, I'm sure you're wondering who the man to my left is. This is Scotty, okay? You can call him Scooter, all right? Then Jimbo addresses the girls, and Brooks' reaction to this is priceless. AKA Scotty, you with me? He's running the show. I'll probably be back in the kitchen helping out. Okay, who's your man in Amsterdam today? Jimbo lines up the women, brings them up one by one. The only disturbing part of this is that Jimbo doesn't check them. He also passes comments on the girls. Compliment her on her lack of nails. My, those are some non-glamorous nails you have. Brooks is not at all comfortable with the way that Jimbo handles the floor and his disagreement can be seen on his face. Although Jimbo is effectively doing his job, the way that he talks to the girls is unacceptable. You know, nail polish is nice. Hey, why don't you grab and get another tattoo before tomorrow too, okay? Brooks is also confused by this very odd approach to doing things. The customers soon pour in and the place starts to get busy. When Brooks spends a little time with the customer's child, Jimbo disapproves and puts him back to work calling him a rookie. rookie. Jimbo also takes complete control over the work environment and keeps the girls for longer periods of time. He doesn't even allow the school going employees to leave. Instead, Jimbo forces the girls to participate in games of his own creation. And for this episode, he had decided that the girls would chow down on beans, but only with their mouths. Jimbo had gone too far. Brianna, how are they, baby? Oh, they look tasty. Who doesn't want to spend the rest of the afternoon with me? It's hard for me on this one to bite my tongue. With that, sadly, we've come to the end of the video. 
Which employee did you find to be the worst? Let us know in the comments down below. If you liked our video, be sure to drop a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching.